Or dishes are piled in the sink, laundry is in heaps, the bed is not made. And this is one personally for me, because the kids climbed into bed at 3 o'clock in the morning, they can learn how to be really quiet and sneaky, you don't even know they're there. And they had an accident wetting your bed. So the bed's not made, even you know it's getting t close to night. And my wife says, I could sure use a break. So you look up from where you're watching TV and, or a movie or football or whatever, and you say, you're right, honey, you do deserve a break. Why don't you come down here and sit with me and watch the game? That's not the concept of self-sacrifice. Because there's actually no sacrifice going on there. <laughs> um, and yet, there's great intentions. By the way, you can tell those are very specific. They're very specific examples because they're very personal examples. Becoming one flesh does not mean that we include our wives in our self-indulgence, our comforts, our habits, our nourishing of our body, but rather we nourish her instead of ourselves. We look to finding a way to sacrifice our flesh for her, not just include her in, bring her into our plans. We put her needs above our own, not on an equal footing of our own, is the concept there. That's what sacrifice means, right? And, and thinking about the sacrifice, the example is given of Jesus Christ. That's the kind of love he demonstrated was completely giving of everything for us. It wasn't him saying, okay, here's some forgiveness for you, some forgiveness for them. It was not this some kind of give and take with Jesus Christ in his sacrifice. You take a few nails, I'll take a few beats. No, it wasn't, was it? It was all him for us. He took all all the sacrifice. And that's the concept. He gave all, not concerning himself with his own flesh, for our eternal and greatest need. And that's what Paul compares the husband's sacrifice to. That's radical, isn't it? It's radical. Well, I believe it's going to take radical practice to become one flesh. But there's the opposite of the wife's practice. The wife's practice. Proverbs 31 describes this in, in just a tremendous detail. We don't have time to go into, into that passage, but the text in Proverbs 31, read that sometime. It describes a virtuous woman. Of course, the woman here, um, I'm sure, is what all women want to be. But the vast majority of the verses speak to her diligence, her ethic, her drive, her devotion to her family. If you read it over and over again, that's what it's about. It's one of submission and suitable help. The husband's main role is leading by sacrifice. The wife's role is supporting by service. That's it. She's not the husband's servant, but rather his assistant, his helper, his advisor, his right hand. She is not lesser of a person, not in ability, talent, or importance, but rather has a very specific role. And Proverbs 31 says, the virtuous, virtuous woman does her husband good all his life. That's the concept of reverencing him. She helps by being a willing support to the man God has given her. Not to walk before or behind, but beside him. But this means that she considers his needs above her own. She looks to please and to help him. I mean, you can see from this, isn't it true, if both would be doing that, both needs would be being met? But just for an example, if the wife is seeking to meet the needs of her husband, and the husband is seeking to meet the needs of the husband, her needs are not being met. And so what usually happens in that kind of a relationship, that struggle, is she recognizes that. And you could reverse it, I know. She recognizes that and says, well, I don't need to meet my needs. And so now they're meeting their own needs. And sure, maybe, maybe some needs are being met, but the two are not becoming one. They're actually going further and further away from becoming one. The primary needs of a husband and a wife. Just briefly, there's a book by Dr. Dr. Eggeriches. I think that's how you pronounce his name. Um, Mrs. Higgins gave it to me. Uh, good book. I haven't read all of it, but I've read some of it. It expounds upon it as the greatest need of husband and wife is the whole point of it. And expounds upon Ephesians 5.33 is what it's about. The book is entitled Love and Respect. The love she most desires, the respect he desperately needs. And I agree with the good doctor because it's exactly what the Bible says in Ephesians 5.33. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular, husband, wife, particular, whichever one you are, so love his wife even as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. Unconditional love and unconditional respect. That's what God is talking about here. 
The Bible doesn't say, husband, love your wife only if she deserves it. And it doesn't say, wife, respect your husband only if he earns it. We err in thinking that love and respect in marriage is to be given if it is earned. It is to be given because it is necessary that both fulfill their roles to become one flesh to bring glory to God in the church. It's necessary. There's another aspect, and I'm not going to go into great detail on this because of time, but 1 Corinthians 7 does speak of the other aspect of physical oneness, the sexual oneness. Um, I'm not into lurid conversations regarding this. I know that's kind of a, a new thing in a lot of churches. Uh, try to attract people with this. The Bible does speak to the sexual relationship, though. And it is an important aspect. If you look in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, you see two principles regarding this. I'm just going to read this for you. It says, Now concerning the things whereof you wrote unto me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife, and let every woman have her own husband. Let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence, and let likewise also the wife unto the husband. The wife hath not, hath not power over her, of her own body, but the husband. And likewise also the husband hath not power of his own body, but the wife. Defraud ye not one the other, except it be with consent for a time, that ye may give yourselves to fasting and prayer, and come together again, that Satan tempt you not for your incontinency. Basically what Paul is saying here, after he just finished in chapter 6, speaking of uh, immorality and fornication, and talked about man joining himself to a harlot and it being sinful and wicked, and he talks about, and he in chapter 6 he says, that man is becoming one flesh with that harlot. And he says, we ought not to consider that. Instead, in verse 6, he says, you are bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. And a lot of scholars believe there was a division between chapter 6 and chapter 7 in some things that the Corinthians wrote back to Paul. And that's why he says in chapter 7, now concerning the things whereof you wrote unto me. He's saying, okay, now I'm going to answer these things you wrote to me. And then he quotes something they wrote to him. He says, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Paul, I don't believe, is saying that. I believe that's, they wrote that to him. That's why he then says, nevertheless, no, that's not the answer, he says. Re literally, that could be read, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. It is good for a husband not to stir up sexually his wife. They're basically saying, well, if we're to live for God's glory, then we ought to just be celibate. We ought to just forget the, the, the pleasures of the flesh and go and do and just live, you know, like the priests, the Catholic priests out there. You just live apart from any kind of physical appreciation. And that's why Paul says in verse 2, nevertheless, no, on the contrary, then that messed up way of thinking, in order to avoid fornication, because fornication is out there, because the sexual relationship is there, and that's the kind of beings we are, get married. <laughs> basically what he's saying here. No, it is proper and it is right in marriage. Of course, in Hebrews it says the marriage bed is honorable and undefiled, but whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. But if there's two just quick comments I can make about this, first of all, I notice that the just like the other aspects of the physical relationship, the part that's non-sexual, the sexual aspects is about giving. He, says, he uses that word. Let the, let the husband render, that's the word give unto the wife. And the same thing, the wife give, likewise, the wife give to the husband. It's mutually given and mutually enjoyed. In fact, he goes so...